Hey everybody, it's Andrew here again, your average jeweler, and we're still trying to make sense of gemstone value. How do you figure out why one gemstone that could look the same is more valuable than another? In our last video, we talked about objectively looking at how pretty the stone was, how big it was, the physical attributes. In this video, we're going to look at the intangibles, the things that are harder to make sense of. But by the end of this video, you're going to have a better understanding of how they figure out the value of a gemstone. Stay with me. If this is your first time on my channel, A, I would encourage you to check out the video that leads up to this, but B, consider subscribing so that we can all learn together. My channel's here for those that want to learn more about jewelry. It's not for the people that already understand it and love it necessarily. It's for those that just want to learn. They have a curiosity. So if you stay with me, we're going to learn together. If you haven't subscribed, consider subscribing. And if you're getting value out of these videos, hit the like button so that others know what to look for. So this video, being more about the things that we can't touch and feel and see, we're going to examine the more supply and demand aspect of value, but specifically how it relates to gemstones. Because supply and demand is a general principle, but it looks very different from one product or industry to another. And we're talking about gemstone value today. So I want to talk about why it's different. And value is something that's very fluid. Value actually can go up and down depending on those supply and demand questions. But when we look at an industry like gemstones, what controls supply and demand? That's what we're talking about. So when it comes to supply and demand, we tend to oversimplify it. We tend to think, well, if I don't want something, then it must not be in demand. Or if I have plenty of something, then there must not be a question of supply. Well, that's an oversimplification of what supply and demand looks like, because there are other factors. With gemstones, one of the biggest ones is rarity. Yes, gemstones are rare, and especially quality gemstones, because the lower the quality and the smaller the size, as we talked about in the first video, the less valuable the gemstone is going to be but a lot of that has to do with the supply of quality gemstones. There are fewer and fewer and fewer as the quality gets nicer and nicer. So rarity is a large component and gemstones is a big category that you see this in. Gemstones are often treated to enhance their quality and or color. Now treatments is a really complex conversation when it comes to gemstones because treatments can be very misunderstood and some treatments are acceptable and some are not. Well, why is that? Well, the reason some treatments are usually more acceptable than others has to do with the fact that some are more stable, meaning you're not likely to lose what was gained when it was treated. So many treatments, if you were to work on the gemstone, if you were to heat up the gemstone, if you were to do anything that could be normal use, you wouldn't have the fear of losing the color that was given to the gemstone when it was enhanced or treated. And that would generally be a more acceptable treatment that's not going to heavily impact the value. Let me give you an example. If we look at a commonly treated gemstone like sapphire, a acceptable treatment is usually heat treatment. And one of the reasons for that is that you can improve the color drastically, sometimes heat even being a natural part of its formation, with just adding some heat. You can improve the color. So this is not a treatment that is susceptible to being lost from other forms of heat. It would take a tremendous amount of heat, as it does in the process, to change the color after the fact. On the other side of that coin, something like a ruby has commonly been treated with lead glass filling, and it makes the stones look much cleaner and prettier than they actually are naturally. Now that is the basis of treatment, so why is this a problem? Well, lead glass filling is not stable. As soon as a jeweler puts his torch to that ruby, the glass is gone. And that's just one example of why stability is a big part of influencing treatments and how they determine value. 
The second question to ask yourself when we're talking about treatments goes back to the availability question. How easily can I get a hold of an untreated product that still looks pretty? And that is something that can be very hard. With unheated sapphires, it is very hard to find attractive sapphires. Therefore, the untreated ones are going to be much more valuable, but it also means that because it's still rare to find sapphire material that's easy to work with, that treated sapphires with heat treatment are still a valuable alternative. Let me give you a few more examples of how gem treatment influences the value. Blue topaz did not really exist before the 60s. It is actually a stone more or less invented through the process of irradiation and heat treatment of natural topaz. Without these processes, natural blue topaz is almost non-existent. It's incredibly rare. So when we see blue topaz, it's usually a treated color. And because the product is so prevalent in its untreated form, the finished product is generally very inexpensive for that reason. If you're getting value out of this video, I hope you'll like it so that others know. And I also hope you'll consider subscribing so that we can keep learning together. I have one last example to share with you as far as gemstone treatment affecting value, and that is jade, especially for markets like the US where we don't have a strong understanding of jade, it's easy to come to the conclusion that jade, or more appropriately, jadeite, is a very valuable gemstone when it looks pretty. But what we don't realize is most of it's been treated. And we get little pieces of jade with the assumption that it's all the same. When we get jade from reliable sources where it's what they call a jade or untreated jade where it's really only been boiled on the surface, that is a very valuable gemstone because it's incredibly rare and for many cultures it's a valued gemstone to them personally and they're willing to pay high enough prices for that value that they perceive. Similarly, when jade is treated, which much of it is, if it's been treated in almost any way, it's lost about 80 to 90% of its value. That's huge. If you think about a stone that would be $1,000, if it's been touched or treated, all of a sudden it's worth $200 at best. That's a big difference. So pay attention to these things. I don't want you to get frustrated with treatments because they're a natural part of making certain gemstones pretty, but I also want you to know what to look for when we start talking about why one gemstone might be more valuable than another. Now we spent quite a bit of time talking about treatments because I want you to understand how important that is to the value, but it's not the only thing when it comes to rarity. The provenance of the stone where did it come from, or sometimes who did it come from? I live in Maine, and Maine has a gemstone tourmaline. It's a gemstone that's not only the state gemstone, but much of it has actually been mined in Maine, and it's a beautiful gemstone with lots of variety, but it's not as easy to find in Maine as some people think. There are actually other places that it's mined, and it's mined at greater quantities, and it actually is more likely to find some nicer qualities. So when people come to Maine and they want Maine gemstones, specifically Maine tourmaline, they're going to pay more for it. And that shouldn't be surprising because there's less of that and someone values that location enough, they value it being locally enough, that they're willing to pay more. Now you can still get beautiful tourmaline from other locations and actually pay the same or even less in some instances but it's not going to be the same to that person looking for it. And therefore the provenance or the location of that stone is very important to those individuals. Now for you, it might not have that same importance, but think about something that you care about. If you're a sports fan and one of your favorite athletes has some kind of item or merchandise available that was his, you are gonna put a higher price tag on it because of where it came from and who owned it and the sentiment and history behind it. So provenance is something to consider when you're talking about gemstones because it does relate to the rarity of the gemstones and ultimately it's going to contribute to the value. Now the final component to understanding gemstone value, yes, the final component, we've made it, is demand. 
Demand is a word used everywhere in economy, and so you shouldn't be a stranger to it, but what does it look like when we talk about gemstones? Well, we've saved this one for last because it's one of the more ambiguous and personal things when it comes to gemstones, and that is do you personally desire it and how many others feel the same way? All these other things that we've looked at have been to understand is there enough to demand to ask the price that I perceive it to have. If 99 out of 100 people want a specific color and a specific size, that's a more valuable gemstone because there's more demand. But we're talking about beauty. It's not the same to everybody. So it looks very different and you have to consider all of these other factors in line with that. Does the providence add demand for you? Does the size matter? when it comes to gemstones. And what colors do you find prettier? These are all things that when we talk about gemstone value, we have to consider. So you might be thinking, or maybe you haven't thought of it yet, but why have I not talked about sapphires being more expensive than another blue stone like blue topaz? Or why emeralds are so much more expensive than peridot? Why have I not made that discussion a big deal. Well, if you pay attention to these other principles, they all make those things fall in line. For instance, the reason sapphires are so much more valuable than these other blue gemstones that we talk about is if their quality is nice and they are pretty gemstones that people find attractive and they are more rare than other gemstones and people want them either because of those other reasons or because of their provenance and history, then the sapphires are going to naturally be more valuable. These same principles that I've been talking about apply across the board and they explain why some of these gemstones are typically more valuable than others. But you have to use them together. You can't just use one of these principles and assume that you have an understanding of how they came up with that gem value. You have to use them all together, but when you do, it suddenly makes sense. So the four parts, just to review, is it large? Is it pretty? Is it rare? And do people want it? Those are the four questions that you need to ask yourself when it comes to gemstone value. Ask yourself, is it important for the size? Is there a certain color that's important? Is it a hard stone to find? And then ultimately, how many other people want it? These are all reasons why one gemstone can be more valuable than another gemstone, and you have to take that into account. I hope you're getting value out of this video. If you are, please like so that others know. And if you haven't commented below recently, I encourage you to let me know what you're thinking. Am I answering your questions? Do you have another question? If you do, ask it. Who knows? It might be the next thing that we answer here. I hope that this has been a learning experience for you because my desire is to try and teach you things that I have learned about jewelry that I found to be confusing at first and I want to make sense of it for you. So I hope that you'll keep learning with me and that you'll stay tuned for more.